Greetings, fellow Rotarians and guests. My name is Joe Young, and it's my honor to serve as the 2020-2021 president of the Rotary Club of Columbus. Founded in 1915 with our first meeting in February of 1916, our club is one of the oldest and largest within Rotary International. Our membership includes a diverse set of leaders within business, city government, military affairs, health care, education, arts and culture, social services, and ministry, all sharing a common desire to improve our community and have a positive impact on the world around us. We started this Rotary year in the middle of the worst health care crisis that the world has seen in over a hundred years. The COVID-19 pandemic has dramatically changed the way we live, work, and interact with each other. We've experienced global economic and educational hardship coupled with ongoing political division and social injustice. The world needs Rotary and the ideals that we represent now more than ever. And while these are extremely difficult challenges to overcome, Rotary remains well positioned to be part of the solution. Following the suspension of in-person Rotary meetings for many months, it is so nice for our club to once again have the opportunity to gather in person here at the Trade Center. For those of you that have not yet returned to our in-person lunch meetings, please know that we are saving you a seat and look forward to having you join us again soon. On behalf of my wife Vicki and our daughters Katie and Lynn, I want to thank you for all that you are doing to make our community a better place to live. It's my pleasure to serve alongside you. Now let's get to work. Is this work? Okay, there we go. Great to see you guys today. Welcome to the June 2nd meeting of the Rotary Club of Columbus. A full room, which is great. There's some tables down front here, guys. We've got a bunch of back row Baptists here, but there's plenty of room up front to, to come get a seat. But if, if you'll join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. It's now my pleasure to call on Teddy Price to come up and bring us today's invocation in accordance to his faith tradition. Let us pray. Gracious Father, thank you for the day that you've given us. Thank you for the time that you've given us to come and fellowship as fellow Rotarians and friends, fostering relationships which encourage service above self. Heavenly Father, we pray that you will place your hands on your world. There's unrest uh, from coast to coast. The pandemic is upon us, and there are nations that are still struggling with uh, the pandemic. We pray that you will guide their leaders and guide their people uh, to a resolution that's fitting in your sight. Heavenly Father, we pray for the, the food that we've partaken today and bless those hands that prepared it. And may your will be done in all things and not our own. These things we ask in your name. Amen. Amen. And don't forget the cans. Thank you, Teddy. It's now my pleasure to call on Lisa Smith, who's going to come up and introduce today's visitors and guests. Good afternoon, President Joe and fellow Rotarians. It is my pleasure to introduce today's guests. For member, Rotarian member Rye Wright, he has his family with him today. We have his wife, Julie, and two sons, Lawson and Riley. So welcome. Good to see you guys. We're very glad to have you. And also we have a fellow Rotarian visiting from the Muskogee Club, Mr. Kevin Launcher. Welcome, Kevin. Yeah, welcome. And those are all of our guests today. Thank you. Well, we're so glad to have you guys with us, and particularly, you know, Riley Lawson. Great to see you guys and Julie too. So um, I'm now gonna call on it's our, our club's tradition to recognize an active duty soldier from Fort Benning every week and we're we're excited to have somebody visiting with us today. And it's my my pleasure to call on Mike Smide with today's introduction. 
President Joe and fellow it's my uh, pleasure and privilege to introduce to you this afternoon, my, uh, introduce Sergeant First Class Juan Vargas. Sergeant First Class Vargas is an 11 Bravo, an infantry soldier, who is currently assigned as the um, NCOIC at the S3 shop at the Western Hemisphere Institute for Security Cooperation, WINSEC, at Fort Benning. As a senior infantry NCO, he's served in a variety of roles to include master gunner instructor, senior drill sergeant, squad leader, section leader, and platoon sergeant. He's had four combat deployments in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom, and he's had one operational support deployment in support of Operation Desert Spring, which was the operation to help keep Kuwait secure after Desert Storm and before Iraqi Freedom. He, as you might expect of an NCO of his uh, time in service and rank, he's had a number of uh, military courses and schools that he's completed. Uh, all of the leader courses, of course, including at his level the senior leader course. But he's also a graduate of the Army Drill Sergeant School, the Bradley Master Gunner course, and the Army Basic Instructor course. Uh, to his credit, he has numerous awards and decorations to include the award of the Bronze Star Medal, uh, eight awards of the Army Commendation Medal, and 12 awards of the Army Achievement Medal. Also, in addition to the Combat Infantry Badge, he also holds something that's difficult to uh, obtain, and that is the Expert Infantryman's Badge. Sergeant First Class Vargas was born in San Nicolas, Mexico. He hails from Texas now. He's married to his wife, Yasmin, and they have uh, three children, a 16-year-old daughter, a 12-year-old son, and a nine-month-old daughter. Uh, he told me that he uh, plans to retire within about the next year and return to uh, the area of uh, Killeen, Texas. Uh, Sergeant First Class Vargas, we have for you today some things. We have first this rotary challenge coin for you to keep on you. Uh, in addition, we have some gifts for you and your wife, um, two tickets to all of the following venues, uh, the River Center for the Performing Arts, the Columbus Symphony Orchestra, the Columbus State University Theater Department, the Springer Opera House, and last but not least, the National Infantry Museum. So we want to give you that. Please join me in a warm Rotary Club of Columbus welcome for Sergeant First Class Vargas. I just want to say thank you to all for having me. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to be here. Thank you all so much. <clears throat> Sergeant First Class Vargas, on, on behalf of our membership, I too want to extend our gratitude to you and the men and women that serve alongside you there at Fort Benning at, at WINSEC. Thank you so much for, for your service to our country and, and our community. I, uh, hearing you from Texas, I, I can't ever hear somebody's from Texas without saying good man, you know, and honor. Rupert Triplett, one of our, our longtime members and a past president. So we appreciate having you in the community and look forward to having you join us again soon. Thank you, Thank you sir. Um, it's now my pleasure to call on past president Michael Silverstein with some Paul Harris recognitions. President Joe and fellow Rotarians, it's always an honor to be able to present Paul Harris fellows. And today, I'm able to do it by virtue of some extreme generosity from one of our own members who made an anonymous donation and selected several individuals to receive this honor. Uh, an individual who fully understands and embraces service above self and the fact that the Rotary Foundation is so significant in terms of the impact it makes not only on our own community, the state, the country, but throughout the world. And today, the two recipients are both individuals that have been heavily involved in working with and impacting in a very positive way young adults in our community. We're very fortunate to have them as Rotarians, and it's my pleasure now to call up Stephanie Payne and Juan Osario to receive their certificates and pins. And when they do, they will be joining a large group of individuals throughout the world who truly understand service above self. Right. 
congratulations. Please, thank you. That's great. Thanks, guys. Wonderful recognition there. Uh, announcements, Friday, June the 25th, is going to be Rotary Day at Fort Benning. Uh, the way this is going to work, we, we're going to need separate RSVPs from anybody that's, that's wanting to go. Uh, guests are allowed um, and, and encouraged. I think it would be great. We just need to make sure that we've, we've got everybody's RSVP, both for themselves as well as any guests. Um, you're going to need, under Fort Benning protocol, you're going to need to be able to show proof of vaccination. So those, those little cards are going to going to come in handy. Fort Benning does not operate under the same rules as the state, so different jurisdiction, federal uh, jurisdiction there. But we're going to meet up in the morning, probably around 930. We're going to we're board buses. Uh, we're going to go to different sites around post. We'll finish the day around 4 o'clock. Uh, some have asked if, if there would be an opportunity to go for parts of the day, and, and yes, we're, we're working on figuring that out, just the logistics and making sure that we can transport everybody around. But I hope that, that all of you will join us for that. That's going to be a really exciting way to, to, to finish the year. Um, please, before you leave the room, those of you that are planning to attend, let us know so we can go ahead and, and get you on the list so that we can make sure there's uh, sufficient transportation for everybody as well as enough food for the day. I uh, made this announcement before, but August 13th through 15th, we're going to have the district uh, party, the district celebration. Um, hope, hope that many of you will join us for that. Uh, we've got a standing RSVP list for the meeting. It's great to see a full room. I think we had 93 last week. Looks like we're that same number, a little bit higher today. We're going to start adding more tables, some, some more place settings. But those of you that are on our standing RSVP list, we've, we've got you. You know, we're, we're expecting you to be here, but if you're not going to be here, you can let us know. And for those of you maybe that are joining us online or haven't yet been back to an in-person meeting, please do let us know uh, that you're going to be here so that we can make sure that the room is laid out appropriately. Uh, at a head table today, we've got Teddy Price brought us the invocation. Uh, Juan Osario, it's now my pleasure to call him forward to introduce today's program. Hey, President Joe. Ooh, it's kind of loud. Good afternoon, fellow Rotarians. It is my pleasure to introduce today's guest, Mr. Chris Largent, who grew up here in Columbus, Georgia, where he gained his knowledge and love for the outdoors as a young child playing in the creeks and the woods surrounding his neighborhood. At the age of 11, he was introduced to the Boy Scouts of America, a program that quickly developed his leadership skills, honed his outdoor skills, and became a major part of his life. After earning the rank of Eagle Scout in 2004, in 2004 and serving as a volunteer with his Boy Scout troop for many years, Chris also graduated from Columbus High School in 2005 and began attending Columbus State University. Chris joined the workforce and the retail world, selling products and becoming sales lead for the local Dick's Sporting Goods stores putting his outdoor knowledge to use. In 2010, he was hired as a general manager for a new smaller specialty outfitter called The Outside World here in Columbus. Again, using his outdoor knowledge and skills to equip the local community with quality and durable gear. He remained there until 2016 when he had the opportunity to purchase the business and become part owner. When the business became unsustainable in 2018, they closed their doors and Chris moved to work for the Boy Scouts of America. Chris took on the role as district executive, or as we call it in the Boy Scouts, uh, outside sales agent for the, what we call the Yellow Jacket District in the Chattahoochee Council of the Boy Scouts. Uh, and this serves uh, so the following counties, Troop County, Heard County, and Merriweather. And through this role, he was introduced and remains a member of the Rotary Club of LaGrange. After 18 months serving these communities and working with the Boy Scouts, Chris had a chance to further his work experience and better himself, and he seized that opportunity. His new role brought him back to Columbus, serving as a district, uh, I'm sorry, as an executive director of the Chattahoochee River Conservancy. While we were sad to see him go in the Boy Scouts of America, we were excited to see him continue to be part of our community. Chris is here today to tell us about what the Chattahoochee River Conservancy is and to tell us all about the great things that they're doing to help the Chattahoochee River. And then additionally, just recently, 
He became one of the youngest board members for the Chattahoochee Council Boy Scouts of America. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Chris Largent. All right, thank you for that great introduction, Juan, and it was a pleasure serving under you as my time as a district executive. So give me two seconds, everyone. I'm going to get my slideshow up. And are we ready? All right, good. All right, first I want to start off, how many of you have ever heard of the Chattahoochee River Conservancy? That is awesome. That is awesome. Because sometimes it's not that way. It's not that way. So our organization, founded in 2010 as the Chattahoochee River Warden, um, we are Columbus-based 501c3 nonprofit. That's a lot of words there. And our mission is to... All right. Next slide, please. Our mission is to use science education and advocacy to protect the Chattahoochee River and its watershed. Now, what is a watershed? Well, quite simply, everything that drains to the river is considered its watershed. So that's creeks, ditches, roadside drainages, um, even stormwater systems that run throughout the city. So how do we do that to protect the river? So again, 2010, we were the Chattahoochee River Warden. In 2018, we changed our name and rebranded ourselves to the Chattahoochee River Conservancy. And that was to do a couple of things. One was to get away from that word warden. So the word warden automatically, um, as people assume that you're a policing agent and that sort of thing. A lot of people thought we were the game wardens, so when they see us on the water, they'd take off. Um, but we, we wanted to be a little bit more integral part of the community versus having that negative connotation right off the bat with just our name. So the Chattahoochee River Conservancy, we decided to move towards a more conservation-based versus litigation and things like that as far as a water keeper organization of sorts, okay? And we believe that riverfront communities are mirrors of, each, of the, the water and the riverfront communities are mirrors of each other. So you can't have a health of one without the health of the other and vice versa. If it's unhealthy for one, the other part is unhealthy. Now, I would like to, to say that we do have clean water here, but there are a vast number of areas that can be improved when it comes to that. And it's not necessarily pollutants directly, and we'll get into that in just a second. But we were founded on the ideas that relationships are the core of the community. And so building relationships within the community and from various stakeholders that have a lot of power in Columbus to further the, the watershed's health and to help protect it for years to come. Let's see if we're working there. All right, so I'm gonna give you a little bit of background uh, for the 2020 highlights for us as an organization. As Juan mentioned, I was only hired back in October um, and started my work and taking this organization from where it was to where we are now has been a tremendous feat. And I really like to, to thank a lot of my volunteers. There are some of you out here in the audience today. But the first part of our highlights, let's go on to the next page. So we have the plants and conservation side, which is a focus that we decided to do again back in 2018. Go ahead, next slide. So how many of you have ever heard of the shoal spider lily? All right, fewer hands, fewer hands. So this plant right here, these are pictures that were actually just taken just a few weeks ago. This is an ongoing project that has been happening since, uh, I think it's 2015 is the first year we started it. And some of you have um, some flyers on your table that if you wanted to open that up, that has a little bit more information about it. But the shoal spider lily is a is a plant that used to be here on the Chattahoochee River. It thrives in areas with cool running water and it has to have flowing water. It will not survive in lakes. It, will, it might survive in your pond if you have enough constant water flowing through it. But next slide. This project and this, or excuse me, this plant was actually eradicated from the Chattahoochee River when they built the dams as Columbus was settled. So this native species, it only grows in about five different rivers in the southeast. You have the Flint River, the Cahaba River, uh, the Okmulgee, there's a small population. And then also there's a river in South Carolina that I completely forgot the name. It's a really, it's, an, it's a Native American name, so it's very hard to pronounce. But 
those are the only known populations of this plant in the entire world right here in the southeast, and we had them in our river before we destroyed them. But as you can see, we've been working for five years along with Nearly Native Nursery, they're out of Fayetteville, and Whitewater Express here in Columbus, Georgia, to bring this plant and restore populations. Next slide, please. That picture was taken just a few days ago. In order for this plant to actually bloom and have a flower like that, that plant has to be rooted for at least two to three years. So that right there is showing proof that this project is working. This project is, is actually doing benefit to the water because these plants, along with the, the if you look around it, those, those plants are American water willow. They help hold soil in place, they help hold sediment in place, but what they do even better is filter water. So they're filtering, filtering out excess nutrients, they're filtering out pollution. So the more plants we have like this in the river, the healthier downstream of us is gonna be. Next slide. That's our team. We were very excited to find these because we've been documenting exactly where these lilies are for the past five years. We didn't even know these existed. We found these while we were just randomly walking around in the river and we found blooms. So again, nature's doing its thing. We're helping it along. We've actually found seed pods. And so these plants are now germinating. They're being um, pollinated correctly. There's only a few species of insects that are known to pollinate these things. One is the hawk moth and the other is the pipe vine swallowtail butterfly. So Again, nature is doing amazing things right here in our backyard. We're just giving it a little help to speed up the process. Um, William Bartram actually wrote in his book about the Chattahoochee River and this specific plant. And I can't remember the exact words, but something along the lines of as far as the eye can see, lining both sides of the Chattahoochee River was this amazing flower and plant, and he named it the show lily. We're working hard to make sure that William Bartram's vision and his image that he had when he visited the banks of the river is, is actually a reality for us once again. Go ahead to the next slide. And so you can see they, they actually grow in, in typically two to three blooms per plant. They only bloom once per night. So they open up at night. That's when they're pollinated. And then those wilt away and the next plant opens a couple of days later. So it's a really cool process to, to get to see. And you can go ahead to the next slide. With the good comes the bad. Anybody knows what that is? That's elephant ears, right? I heard it somewhere. So that is what we call taro. Um, it, is a, it is a Chinese plant that grows like weeds, and it chokes out the habitat that our show lilies eat. So this plant actually grows in like a bulb, and in some countries they eat it. They say it tastes like yams. If you want some, I will go grab some and you can try it, but I am not, I'm not going to try that. And it is a delicacy to some people. Um, so, you know, we, we tried to pull out some of this stuff a few years ago, and we pulled about 500 pounds out, and we quickly realized that it would take a team of three times the amount of people here to make a dent in the population that we have growing in the river. Now, what can you do to stop this? I know some of you may not want to hear it. Don't buy them and put them in your ponds, okay? This is an invasive species that grows super quick. Birds carry the seeds. Um, it's, it's amazing how quickly this could spread, and that's how it did spread. It came from ornamental gardening, okay? There are lots of other alternatives that are native that we would love to talk about. So you can see, um, the next slide, please. Um, this is what they look like when they've been pulled up out of the ground. All right, go ahead, next slide. The next one that's invasive that we want to talk about quickly is water hyacinth. If you've ever been to Lake Eufaula, you've seen these large masses of plants growing and clogging up boat ramps. Water hyacinth is one of the fastest growing plants in the world. The seeds they produce, each flower produces thousands of seeds a year. Those seeds are viable for, let me see the, the number, they're viable for 28 years. So thousands of seeds being produced, and somewhere in that time frame, they could sprout up, clog up boat ramps. How many of you have boats? You don't want boat ramps clogged up with this stuff. You'll have to be repairing your boat uh, props every single year. Next slide, please. They're very pretty. You see, they, they bloom these purple flowers. But once again, something we don't want in our watershed, because it's choking out the habitat for the native plants, 
And those native plants are very beneficial to us because the pollinators and everything pollinate correctly with those plants. Next slide. And there's one more. Um, Lake Eufaula has really worked hard to try and get some of that out. Uh, I know that some people do believe that the water hyacinth is not as harmful as it is, but when you think about how quickly that could spread, Lake Eufaula could be covered completely, and then you'd have no boat access. So next slide. And then back to some good. So this stuff, if you notice, if you go out here to the Chattahoochee and look in the middle of the white water, you see these vast mats of green stuff. That's American water willow. Now water willow, again, pairs with show lilies. Um, it filters out nutrients, but also it provides macro habitat for the little tiny bugs that fish need to survive. They, they eat those bugs and grow into bigger fish. That is super beneficial, plus it holds all that sediment in place. We all know what sediment does when it washes down the river, right? How many of you have been to the sandbar at Lake Harding lately? That sandbar has shifted like five or six times. There's two new sandbars, too, that we're going to scope out tomorrow. So sediment is a major, major issue going on right now, and these plants help hold it in place, and they filter water. All right, next slide, please. On to the fish and wildlife aspect. So if you've been on the Riverwalk or even up to Lake Oliver, and um, we do have some on Lake Harding, these signposts that you see are fishing line recycling tubes. Now, what does that do? Well, it's exactly what it is. It's an area for fishermen to take their spent line instead of throwing it on the ground and put it in the tube, and we go and collect that and send it off to be recycled. Berkeley is one of the major sponsors, as well as the Boating US Foundation. Uh, these things are very useful. They're being used very well. And if you go to the next slide, what we're trying to prevent is this. This is a great blue heron that we found a few years ago that almost died because it was tangled in fishing line. We work with another nonprofit called Savage Heart, and I'm sure some of you are aware of Savage Heart. They are wildlife rehabbers, and the amount of calls that they get for fishing line entanglement is atrocious. We can do better as a community. These anglers can do better. And quite honestly, next slide, they're getting the picture. We're collecting a lot of this line every single time, and we're, we're cleaning these out typically tw uh, every other month. So this one was Lake, Lake Oliver, I think, just a few months ago. Next slide. And that one's right there in front of Synovus again a few months ago. My interns actually just cleaned out the, um, the fishing line recycling tubes yesterday, and I don't have the data yet. But, all right, next slide. One of our fun pet projects that we've had, um, if you were dropping off your Christmas tree after Christmas last year, you probably saw our truck and trailer and me feverishly piling Christmas trees onto it. Now what we're doing with those is we're turning those into fish habitat. As you can see here, um, Georgia, or excuse me, D Georgia DNR, um, that's our fisheries guy Brent over there, he helped us build these pallet structures in which we stuffed Christmas trees into, and then we put those into various areas around the watershed. Now what that's gonna do is that habitat gives the fry, uh, the small baby fish that they're, that they're breeding in their hatcheries, it gives them an opportunity um, to hide, but it also has a place for bugs and the macroinvertebrates to gather so that those fish can eat them, and they hide them from other bigger fish. So a lot of people use Christmas trees in their farm ponds and things like that to provide structure. The more structure you have, the more uh, healthier your fish population is going to be. We put these things in Lake Oliver. We put a few of them at the fishing pier. We put them up on Lake Harding as well, around that fishing pier up by the Long Bridge. And then we put a lot of them in West Point Lake. Next slide, please. Um, to, the, to the tune of a 30-foot barge, we had 10 of those things stacked on top of it. And you can see uh, one of the cool pictures there with our fisheries guy. And next slide. Here's a, an example when the drawdown at West Point happened. Um, those are 14-foot Leland cypresses that we got from a tree farm in Valley, Alabama. Um, I went back and, and actually released some fish in this area, and those those trees are now two feet underwater, but there were already fish stacked up underneath them. I was watching them on my depth finder. So it's a really cool project that we have seen to fruition. And the next slide will show you, um, we met with DNR as just a friendly gesture to help out that program for them to restock. We put a half a million small fry into West Point Lake at those various habitat sites. So we're trying to grow largemouth bass. The population there has been decimated over the years because of the spotted bass and striped bass. Next slide. All right, this one's a little bit more closer to my heart, litter mitigation. Um, from my time at Outside World, and I actually 
through the Boy Scouts, um, I actually, one of my first events was a cleanup that called Help the Hooch. If you're familiar with Columbus, you know Help the Hooch. And, and it baffled me why we were cleaning up at Oxbow Meadows, which was a former landfill. We were cleaning up a landfill and putting it somewhere else. Well, that, that one event kind of sparked this whole thing. And as we were developing um, our business at Outside World with the kayaks and the community, we were leading monthly cleanups and things like that. So what better way to put that to use? Next slide. So looking at this, we did an impromptu cleanup right after I got hired. That spot, that, you, know, you can see the boat is full of trash, like to the point where there's no room for anybody else. We exceeded the max capacity and it still floated, so it was pretty awesome. But that stretch of river is just about a mile downstream, and that's just one little bit of, of impact that Columbus is having on the watershed in a negative way. Next slide. We led a couple of cleanups here um, in the public parks um, because the city did not have the, the, you know, the opportunity to have all the staff, especially with COVID and everything. There was a lot of, a lot of things, so we decided to help out. This one was at Cooper Creek uh, in January, and we had 40 volunteers step up to help us clean in the middle of January. It was like 28 degrees that morning. Next slide, please. And then the same thing happened in February at Heath Park. We pulled in from each site over a thousand pounds of trash. Next site. Now this is the big one. Mercer campus coming to town. We decided to work with Uptown Columbus, and I think I forgot the name. It's the land, the land trust. I think Chattahoochee Valley Land Trust owns the property right in front of Mercer that's on the riverbank where there was a large population of homeless people, but it was also a spot in the river where the debris during the floods just seemed to gather. So that dumpster, you can't really tell how full it is, but three and a half tons, three and a half tons was literally 20 feet away from the river walk. And it had been there for quite a while. So you see these impacts that we as an organization are making. Our job is not to clean up trash. I wish I could get paid to just pick up trash. It would be awesome. But our job is to engage the community and put this information out in front of people like you, the leaders that are in Columbus, to help us make a difference. Next slide. Shows some of our scouts um, in John Smiley's troop um, picking up. They found some road signs and some stuff like that. It's, it's amazing to see some of the things you get to pick up uh, at some of these locations. All right, next. So this beautiful piece of floating contraption is called a trash trap, and its technical name is in-stream tributary litter collection device. I think that's what we call it. But we're going to stay with trash trap because that's so much easier. This is a new project. We installed this a little over a year ago on Bull Creek, right where Waracoba Creek comes in. Just this year alone, we have pulled 1,000 pounds out of that floating contraption. And it's just that one. Next slide, please. There's some of the impacts. We actually just cleaned it up about two hours ago. And Juan was like, I'm glad you went home and changed. So <laughs> it was, it's not fun sometimes being this deep in, in water and, and picking up other people's trash. So this program is actually expanding. Go to the next slide. Here's some more. This was after a rain a few weeks ago. I think that total was over 337 single-use plastic bottles. Think about it, 337 bottles. Imagine if one water bottle could replace all that. And it can. It can. Next slide. So this is, again, this is from this morning that I just threw in there really quickly. Next slide. All right, the next program, this is one of the, the other programs that we really like to do. It's called Swim Guide. And basically, it is water quality testing. We do testing at all different sites. You can see here um, we have Lake Harding, Lake Oliver, and we added Lake Eufaula last year. So what we're testing is we're testing for the presence of E. coli and fecal coliform. But this is an opportunity for recreational users to download this app and actually see what the, the real time, well, not real time, it's from the day before. They can see what the beaches and recreational areas that they're visiting, um, levels um, red so they can make up their mind whether or not they want to take a risk and swim. Now, we will put out this, dis we have this disclaimer on our website. These are not real-time numbers. These are from the time that we 
and, and for that time only. As we all know, water changes, especially here in Columbus when we have release schedules on the dam. So these numbers could fluctuate within 10 feet of each other. Within two minutes, those numbers could be drastically different. But we put this out as an advisory just to give people an idea of what they tested at that certain point. Next slide. And you see we have a, a couple of interns this year. I'm actually excited. We have eight interns at a time when businesses are, are hard up for finding people to actually work for money. I have eight young people that are really passionate about this, and they're willing to help us. They're all from college and high school, so I've got a good mix of everything. So the next one is up on Lake Harding. You see we test all the way up from... Uh, almost to the dams, the low head dams that are slated to be removed in the next few years. So we've got a wide range and that takes a lot of resources. Each of those tests actually run us about $10 and that's not counting time, travel fees, boat fees, all that kind of stuff. All right, next slide. So a little bit of overview for 2021. We've gotten over 100 new volunteers added to our list and have been engaged to help out their community by either internships or the, the trash cleanups or helping us clean out the trash traps. Again, three and a half tons was removed from the watershed, not counting the trash trap. That thousand pounds of trash, right at about a thousand, was removed from Bull Creek alone. Over 100 Christmas trees on top of those pallet trees were added to the watershed in various spots to help improve fishing uh, habitat. Four miles of fishing line, think about that. Fishing line, you know, you see how thin it is, four, over four miles of it stretched end to end. Nearly a half million largemouth bass stopped in, and now I had, I had 10 interns when I made this, but we had two get real jobs, so they decided, they decided that was a little bit better, and I applaud them for it. Um, so I had, to, I had to change that one. All right, next slide. Now, for the remainder of 2021, we've got a few hefty projects and lofty goals. Uh, next slide. So our tributary trash trap program, we are expanding that. We have written agreements from the city, signed, sealed, ready to roll for three more trash traps in Columbus. We're gonna put one on Lindsay Creek, and that one's in partnership with Columbus State University. They're gonna be doing some studies on, on litter and things like that as well. And then we're gonna have one on Cooper Creek, right inside Cooper Creek Park. And what that's gonna do is gonna allow us to have something that's visible. We can put signage to help educate the public. It's a visual impact when you're walking through the park and you see 300 water bottles sitting there that have been collected. And it's stopping it from going into the lake, which we clean that up again. There was another group that just cleaned it up last week and pulled out about a thousand pounds after our cleanup back in January. And then, of course, we also have one going in, in in Phoenix City on Mill Creek. So that is a major artery coming into the Chattahoochee River from the Alabama side of things. So we've got both sides protected. Bull Creek is going to stay there because, as we know, most of the creeks in Columbus feed into Bull Creek. And that's why there's such a high amount of trash there. And so the Trash Trap Fund, if you, um, we'll get to a spot where I'm going to get you to use your phones here in a second. But we'll talk about that. The Trash Trap Fund is always looking for partnerships. Um, we can do everything from colored buoys to match your company logo. You name it, we can probably do it. So if you're interested in, in helping in that aspect, please let me know. And then, of course, like I said, the partnership with Columbus State University, we're really starting to grow that because they're pulling interns and sending them to me. They're, they're pulling their students that they feel would have a very good uh, opportunity there and they're pulling it. I just had um, an intern from Columbus State for the spring semester that developed our ETAP protocol, which is a, a program called Escaped Trash Assessment Protocol. And basically, every time we clean out that trash trap, we are looking at the total number of bottles, but we're also breaking it down by brand. And our goal there is not to necessarily badmouth those companies like Coca-Cola or Sprite we want to figure out collectively how we can take those brands and take this data and say, how can we reach the end consumer? Because that's where the problem lies. The problem does not lie with the companies. They're producing it. The end users are the ones that are either tossing it or, or letting it um, go unsecure in the back of their trucks and the, the wind blows it out. Next slide. 
So again, there's a couple of photos of the trash trap. Those are typically the, the most impactful. There's the one on Cooper Creek. And then the one here at Columbus State University is gonna be on campus. Oh, go ahead, next slide. So that's Cooper Creek, next slide. That one's uh, the one on Lindsay Creek. And as we know, that one flows in front of the mall. Um, so there's always some goodies that, that blow into that one. Next slide. And then that one is Mill Creek, and that one's going to be anchored right below the pedestrian walkway, again, so that we can put some educational signage with it to explain what it is and hopefully make an impact on people as they walk by and read it. Next slide. All right, the fishing line recycling. We have eight more stations that are actually going to be installed tomorrow. So we have lots of opportunities there. We still have some sponsorship opportunities. I'm trying to wrap it up. we got three minutes. Next line. All right, swim guide, we have expanded this year. We added two more sampling sites to the Whitewater area, and we also added a couple of sites um, up on Lake Harding just to give us more data, and we're going to be testing a little bit longer to have a better data set so that when we go into next year, we can address problems. And next slide. And the show lilies. So we have a couple of things going on. We have over 3,000 plants this year to plant, and we have some opportunities um, that we had not had before because most of them require us rafting down the river to find the spots to plant. Um, we have a couple of spots that we found right out there with low water, we can walk to them, and we're gonna really hit that area hard because that's where that one photo that I showed you was blooming. And then, um, next slide. That's the one, that's the lily. So that thing is about this big. And it, it's very rare to see them that big unless they're in groves like they, they grow on the flint in yellow jacket shoals. All right, next slide. So how can you help? This is the part I like to do. I challenge each of you to help, whether that's sharing our posts, telling your story about how, how water quality or how this has changed, that has changed and affects as far as pollution and litter and things like that. If you can attend any of our cleanups, please come out. We, we definitely could use the help, especially if you want to clean the trash trap, bring some waders and some boots. Um, you know, support us by, by just giving us a hand, like telling people about us, telling people about why you think it's important to have clean water. You know, that less than 1% of the Earth's fresh water is available for us to drink, and we're letting this stuff happen. Next slide. All right, everybody pull out your phones. Pull out your phones, grab your camera, scan that QR code. I forgot where it takes you. It probably takes you to our website. <laughs> I mean, I made this like six months ago. So. so again, like us on Facebook, check us out. If you have any questions uh, directly related to anything I've talked about, uh, please come see me. I know we're running short on time here and I apologize, but that's it. Um, are there any questions for Chris from the room? I was like, I say, Kent. Are you planning on putting another 500,000 large mouth bass back in Lake Harding? Repeat the question. So, are we going to put another 500,000 baby bass in Lake Harding? I will have to get back with you on that. That was a project led by DNR. Um, but we definitely are interested in helping. Um, we also stocked a few years ago, you know, some shoal bass here in Columbus. We have not gone back and done a study yet. We're, we're hoping to, as well as uh, some of the area on North Harding where there's shoal bass. But I can definitely, you know, answer that question later on after I talk with my fisheries guy. Sure. Since the dams have been breached, have you all seen the shoal bass? You said you haven't maybe completed the study, but I'm just curious if there are more shoal so the question was, um, after the dams, have we seen more shoal bass? Um, n the answer is no. Um, we have not seen an increase, but we have not been directly looking. You know, the stocking program that happened a few years ago was to help the population. Um, I do not think we've done any shock surveys to see if that has helped or not. We're looking to first add some more habitat, like the water willow and the shoal lilies, because that's step one of the process. We can put fish all day long, but if they don't have food to eat, they're going to die. Um, plus, with the, the high levels that we have now coming through that area, as we're things regulated. So they kept a lot of that storm surge and everything that we see now, they kept that regulated. 
And so we're not sure if that has hindered them and pushed them downstream, and they can't survive in that, in that slack water. They have to have that running water and cool water too. So have not seen an increase necessarily, but I know that in the fishing community page, I saw a, a shoal bass a few, it's probably about a month ago, that was caught that was probably about five pounds. So there are still some, there are definitely still some. Any other questions? Cool, thank, thank you. you. Chris, we, we appreciate you presenting to us today. We appreciate the great work that you and your, your team are, are doing and helping keep the, the waterways clean. And, and we're happy to do our part, you know, spread the word um, and, and certainly, you know, make sure that our own impact is, is not going to contribute negatively to the river. Uh, we have a custom of, of honoring our, our speakers by donating a children's book to the Columbus Public Library uh, with their name. So we're happy to do that for you for you today and we thank you again for being here. I want to remind everybody that there will be a replay of today's program on our Facebook page as well as a YouTube link going out shortly after the meeting. Uh, we've got a happy hour, uh, but it's still an online uh, rotary happy hour uh, tomorrow night from 6 to 8 p.m. so that'll be a great way to connect with some folks. If you're in the room, you're planning to be back in the room and you're not already on the standing reservation list, please let us know. But also, if you're wishing to participate in the day at Fort Benning, please go ahead and let us know on your way out so that we can get that list together. Hope that everybody has a, has a fantastic week. Go out, serve others above yourself. Let's get to work.